Hey there, I'm Cindy Coaches, and I am the host of Pen to Paper Press podcast. I enjoy talking with best-selling authors, writers, editors, publishers, and creative souls in my virtual studio. Our conversations range from exploring mindsets and our experiences to the process of developing our stories and the pearls of wisdom that we've learned along that journey that started when we put pen to paper. Liz Meritz is an emerging author with a background in process improvement and project management. Liz writes and narrates nonfiction and fiction books. In April of this year, she published Brody Monster, A Perfectionist, and The World's Most Imperfect Terrier, which I love the title of that book. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast studio, Liz. I've been looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. I'm also looking forward to it. I I don't know what I love talking about more. Um, I love project management and just being able to apply it to writing and book production has been really exciting. Um, I feel like I've really gotten to test my knowledge, so I'm excited to talk about it today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got that firsthand knowledge of, ooh, this works, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And as someone who is a perfectionistic traits um, or tendencies, it's not on everything, but some things, I have to ask, what are some of the lessons, Brody, your imperfect terrier, <laughs> what did Brody teach you that you were able to apply to writing Brody Monster? Oh my gosh, Uh, that could be a whole, that could be a whole series, but I'll try to, I'll try to cover (laughs) the big ones. Um, Rhodey, I think really taught me, I think, I think some of us perfectionists have this, um, we we live kind of this sheltered uh, life of perfectionism, Um, especially, you know, me growing up kind of rural, middle class, like I didn't have a lot of major life challenges that that I faced as I was growing up and matriculating through school. And I think what Brody taught me is that I actually cannot like legitimately cannot control everything that happens um, in a given scenario. And, And I had done a pretty good job up until the point of, of bringing Brody home. I had done a pretty good job of, of maintaining a a level of control that felt very, uh, you know, achievable, but um, yeah, he taught me that you can you can be the best planner in the world. You can do all of your research. You can check all the boxes, but you just can't control everything. <laughs> oh, not with the puppy terrier. <laughs> yes, with, no. <laughs> <laughs> with the puppy at all, but a terrier, they're high energy and they want to go, 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 go. And not at any slow pace at all. <laughs> Definitely not. No, he's, he is... um we go for a walk almost every day and we try to average, I try to average about 14 to 16 miles a week. Uh And we see there are a few other wire haired Fox terriers that live around our neighborhood, which is actually very interesting to me because they're just not a common breed that you see a lot. And the first time we met this older wire haired Fox terrier, the owner said, yeah, those, those wire Fox terriers, they, um, they're puppies and and then they die. (laughs) And he was like, they just never become they never like an up. old geriatric dog is what he was trying to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I was like, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's in that regard. And, and yes. <laughs> not my first reaction was like, oh. <laughs> no, he was just, he was just saying, you know, they never grow old. They just, they're always young at heart and physically. <laughs> And you and I spoke, uh, what, a week ago, and in that conversation, we briefly talked about some of the research that you found that suggests that 97% of authors never publish their book. And you shared some insights with me on how authors can achieve their goals. Uh, Do you mind taking a, a bit of time to, let's just explore this, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll just dive in and, and please interrupt me if you have any questions, because this, I could talk on this for an hour. So I'll try to, I'll try to break it up into digestible um, bits and pieces, <laughs> but um, 
I think I think the key word here is avoiding procrastination because um, I think a lot of people who embark on the journey of authoring a book, especially for the first time, but even the people who have probably, and I'm, I'm not speaking from experience here, but because I've only written one book, but <laughs> from talking with other authors, I, I suspect that this doesn't just happen on the first book um, as well. So <laughs> I would uh, say that it's probably most writers on any book. Yes. So how, and, and when I started this book, I had one goal in mind and that was to complete it. Um, and I didn't, and I didn't really, I didn't really have any other goal other than I just knew that I did not want to start this project and leave it hanging out there in the balance for the rest of my life. I wanted to make sure to get it done. So, um, and I will just say like, initially I started this book in July of 2015. Um, I was working full time for a large company and I was doing IT for them. So I had a very demanding job. I was trying to write this book and I just kind of started chipping away at it. I thought that it was going to take me about two to three years. It ended up taking me about six years. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I just readjusted my expectations along the way. And I think that's one of the biggest things that you can do um, as you're, as you're entering a project like this. So I think the first thing to avoid procrastination is just know that whatever you start out thinking is going to happen is probably not going to be what happens, but it's okay to start a project with this like framework in mind of how it's going to happen and um, how long it's going to take. Just also know that it's okay to adjust that as you get in and you learn more and certain factors are introduced and 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 you and you gain a knowledge base around whatever whatever you're um, you're doing. So um, that would be the the first kind of piece of advice that I would that I would uh, convey to to someone. And then the the next thing is once you actually sit down for the first time and write, it doesn't matter whether you do an outline or you just kind of let the words flow onto the page. I'm not here to tell authors how they should approach uh, creating a book because that's going to be different for different people Almost and different true. people are going to be successful. Yeah. With different, with different methodologies. But I will say um, don't ever get up from your writing desk desk or your laptop or your cup of coffee or whatever, whatever it is you think of, you know, your, your writing environment, don't ever get up from your writing environment without thinking about what you want to accomplish next and when. Oh, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I like that. That makes yes. a lot of sense. And when, <laughs> yes. and when is, when is the big thing? Um, so I call this time blocking, which I think everyone can probably say like, Oh yeah, but I get that. I know what that means. Um, I, um, I like to plan out a little bit farther ahead. So I do, I would say what I call long tail time blocking. So I'll basically sit down every three to four months and look at what I have, you know, on the horizon for a project and not just book projects, but anything. Um, and I will block out my time. And then of course, having small kids, I have to be like, okay, and I'm going to need a sitter here. And I'm going to need to let my husband know that he's got to do like bedtime duty on these days. And <laughs> <laughs> it gets very involved. But um, usually, usually I would say, you know, three to four hours for that amount of long tail time blocking it works for me. Um, it takes a little practice too. But you might be one of those people, you know, that sits down and says, I'm just going to block out the next week. So you might get up, you might be getting ready to get up from your desk, give yourself 10 minutes to just inhale, appreciate what you've accomplished that day, pat yourself on the back a little bit. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, and then figure out, okay, when I sit down again, I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z, and I am going to do that next Wednesday afternoon. And I, I know it sounds very simple, but just having the discipline to take that time and say, I'm going to plan out my next step before I get there. It gives you something to look forward to. Um, 
Well, and it provides yeah. you a bit of co- accountability too, because like you said, it's easy to say, but actually doing it is, is that next hurdle. And I'm, I would assume you probably said like a, a calendar notification or something like that as well, or you have it on a schedule. So I, this is great. I love this. <laughs> Yeah, so if we're talking of, about yeah, I'm sorry. Go if ahead. If we're talking about no, I was, if we're talking about specific tools, um, I I just use a Google Calendar, mm-hmm. um, and I just block out you know two or three hours to do whatever I need to do depending on what it is. And I also I love my Apple Watch, and I'm not I don't work for Apple. I don't have any association with Apple, but <laughs> it literally reminds me what I have to do. Like it tells me like the next thing that I have on the agenda every day, and. I personally love that. So um, definitely having some type of integrated calendar helps immensely. So I know that I'm probably more tied to my calendar than many people, but if you are trying to get something done on any type of deadline, whether it's uh, an urgent deadline or kind of a self-imposed deadline, use a calendar. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. Agreed, definitely. Back to the the tools that you were talking about, there are plenty of them. And of course, finding the one that works for you is is key. And I would say exploring those options to finding, because not all of them are going to work. I mean, that's a given because we're all different. We all have unique ways of functioning. But exploring those different tools, and I I appreciate the Google Calendar or a scheduling calendar because of the fact that that's what I do. So <laughs> high five to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, it doesn't have to be an expensive, you know, software suite. It's just whatever works for you and whatever you can commit to. And a lot of the times, those are not the most expensive things. So so then what do you think causes some of that hesitation or that resistance to follow through and, and, and keep that momentum going? So I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I would say I think it is that lack of sort of prepping for the next step, kind of what I was talking about, you know, figuring out what you're going to do next and when. Um, I think we've all been in a situation where um, we've been faced with something unknown. And sometimes if you know that something's going to be awful, it's almost easier to face that than if you don't know what's going to happen at all. And I'm not saying that sitting down at your desk to write a book is going to be awful, but (laughs) I do think (laughs) maybe some days it is. If it's like an editing phase or something and you're just like, I can't do this anymore. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But I think sometimes people don't say, this is what I'm going to do next. And so they sit down and they're like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know what's going to happen today. And I think that that can really dissuade someone from continuing uh, on a project. So I would say that's fear of the unknown. Um, But the nice thing about writing a book is to some extent, you don't have to be a victim of the fear of the unknown. You can say, this is what I'm going to do next Wednesday. I keep using Wednesday as a, as an example, but (laughs) this is what I'm going to do next Wednesday. And, you know, I'll get as far as I can get and that's fine. Um, And then I'll reevaluate and I'll plan out what I'm going to do the following, you know, the following week or the, or, or Thursday or Friday. So I really think just, at least for me, it's trying to avoid that situation where I have time blocked out for something. I've been intentional. I've gotten childcare lined up. Um, You know, I have the peace and quiet. I've minimized my distractions. And then I sit down and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing today. And then I get, I start to panic and I'm like, I'm not going to use my time wisely. And it's, this is, this is going to be a complete waste and I'm being, you know, inefficient. At least that's, that's my personal, I guess, uh, assessment. <laughs> and, and letting go of that 
because we as perfectionists we have that tendency of it's got to be right the first time and anybody who writes knows that oh some people call it the shitty first draft some call it the vomit draft some call it you know whatever else um some some form of pain <laughs> for that first draft and it, it is hard and and i had a, a gal in one of my um group coaching sessions that she wanted she wanted the first draft to be like perfect and it's like it's not gonna happen and everybody in the group is like yeah give that up <laughs> it's not gonna happen okay. and by knowing that and and understanding that what you write down is not going to necessarily be in the final product is it, it's it's like this gift we give ourselves that's like oh okay I can take that pressure off of me because there are some things that perfection out the window you know free or free free for all let's go let's get messy let's get dirty but there are certain things for me that it's like it's got to be great it's it's got to be awesome it's got to knock my socks off and uh that was one of those things that many many years ago i i learned that with writing let it be just let the words flow figure out how to make those words flow <laughs> or just allow them to so you bring up something that I, I was going to ask you about, which is as a mom with kids and a terrier running around your house, when when did you find that time to write? Were you doing it like once a day? Were you doing it, like you said, blacking out as your example on Friday afternoons? <laughs> so how, as a busy mom and a working mom, how did you find that time uh, to write? Yeah, so um, I have to be completely honest. Um, we, my husband and I have like a financial situation where I, I have like pretty easy access to childcare and I did not have to find time a lot of the time. I could create it for myself. Nice. And I think that's a big difference because I really, I really have a lot of, um, I have a lot of admiration for moms who don't have the support net that I had that still are able to create these things. I have some friends here in St. Louis who um, they they rarely hire a babysitter. They don't have a nanny. They don't send their kids to daycare. And they're starting, you know, really, really wonderful online businesses um, without that extra support. So I can say moms come in all shapes and sizes and capabilities <laughs> and, um, you know, some of us, some of us are fortunate enough to be able to create our own uh, space, space and time to work. Um, others, those super moms out there, are like just doing it regardless of of what they've got going on. And you know, just for anyone else who's in my situation, don't beat yourself up over those people because I that that's something that I tend to do is is say like oh my gosh, I should have been able to do this without, you know, childcare. And I should have been able to do this, you know, on my own. And so I will say I, I made it happen because I invested in, in the childcare and I invested um, sometimes even in pet care because I have a high energy dog. And if I had a week where I was just like plowing through a couple chapters and just like getting it done, uh, we would have to send him to doggy daycare. Like, I'll be completely honest about that. Like, sometimes he just like went off to school. <laughs> he went off to school with the kids. <laughs> That's awesome. um, yeah. So, I mean, it's going to be very individualized for each, uh, for each mom. Um, but I do think you have to think about, do I have to find this time? Or, or can I create this time? And if you have the ability to create that time, that's a conversation to have with your partner, your spouse, or whoever's in your support net. Uh, and, and just make sure that you've got, you know, what you need to, to, to create that product. But um, if you're finding time, you just do, you just do what you can when you can. And don't look at anyone else. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. If it takes you eight years to write your first book, guess what? 
I've been listening to a lot of author interviews lately, and that's actually pretty common, especially for those of us who start writing in our late 20s and early 30s. So um, yeah, it's, again, it kind of goes back to you can't control everything. And so don't make this something that is a burden, make it something that is an outlet for your creative energy. And if you need to take a nap one day instead of writing, just go take that nap, sister. Just go get that sleep. Like you do you. I love it. Oh, nap time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, right? it could save you. A nap could save you four hours of editing later on, right? Exactly. Agreed. Because if you're, when you're in it, you're in it. When you're, when you're trying to force it, you're not in it. And yeah, you're right. That is where a good chunk of like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? Editing happens. <laughs> well, and I will also say, so as a, I, I have a PMP credential, which is a project management professional credential. So I basically had to like take a test and get a certification, just like, you know, a real estate agent or a CPA or something like that. So I have that project management background. In order to maintain that credential, I have to do continuing education credits. Okay. So I actually wrote, sorry, I actually edited a majority of Brody Monster while I was at a PMI conference. This was before COVID shut down the world. Um, I edited most of the book while I was at a PMI conference in Philadelphia, waiting for my sessions to begin. <laughs> Oh, wow. And so you get to a room, you know, you'd have 15 or 20 minutes before the speaker would stand up and the session would start. And I just had my little, I had my little like iPad with my keyboard and I was just editing, you know, a couple pages here and there. When I sent that uh, edited version back to my editor after getting back from that conference trip, he was like, what did you do? This is amazing. <laughs> and I was like, I had no children and I was breaking it up into really small pieces of work at one time. And my brain was like, on fire that whole week so <laughs> that is that's a brilliant way of doing your editing because you're you're focused wholeheartedly and it's not because you're bored it's because you know you want to get this done you're in an environment where you can you know just sink yourself into it and you're working in it on it in short clips. So you're really focused on what's on the page right now, right in front of you versus the, okay, what did I say three chapters back? You're in the yes. moment. And, then, and there are other times for that. You can catch that later, but I right. was working on sentence structure and active voice and all that fun stuff. So <laughs> that's great. And then, you know, as that, that, um, I want to say product management, and I know that's wrong. Um, but as someone who is working on projects all the time, and you're always writing out your deadlines and, and making those, what are some tips that you can share for someone who has no concept of what somebody who does project management, you know, so they so they can implement you know, maybe a, a bit of what you have to share. Yeah, so I'll give, this is one way that you can approach it. There are a hundred different, a thousand different ways you could approach it, but I'll just share kind of what I do. And, you know, just so everyone that's listening knows, like, this is not the only way to do it. Um, so there are, I'll get kind of technical for a minute, just for people who are interested in the project management side. There well, are approximately seven different um, distinct project management frameworks. So there's, you've probably heard of Agile, Scrum, Lean, Waterfall. These are, just Google these. I'm not going to get into it because that's, that's like a lot of information. But um, my, I started my career doing waterfall projects and I uh, very, very quickly sort of converted to Agile. And the difference between those two, um, those two methodologies is that Waterfall basically asks the project manager to create everything from, from the beginning. So you basically plan out the entire project. You would have to literally have a list of tasks that got you from 
sitting down, before you sit down the first time to write until the book is in production and, you know, for sale on Ingram Spark or, you know, it gets you, it, it is supposed to encompass the entire process from creation to production to publication. Okay. What Agile does, and this is why I love it, um, and I think most people prefer, I'm just speaking for most project managers and, and people in general, prefer Agile because what you do with Agile is it, it's called a methodology, but it's really more of a skeletal framework that allows you to kind of put your own stamp on it and make it what you want it to be. And the core tenet of Agile is that you come up with like this very minimal product that you're going to create first. So um, someone might start out by saying, I'm gonna create an outline for my book, a two page chapter outline. I want it to be approximately eh, 30 chapters. And they might put that outline together. Um, and so then that's their first product and then you're done. And so that's one iteration. Okay. And then you come back to it and you say, um, so now the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna write one chapter. I'm gonna write chapter five. Maybe I'll start in the middle. I'm gonna write chapter five. So you write chapter five, no edits. You just get it on paper. It's about, you know, what, 1500 words, you're done. Okay. And then you come back to it and you say, I'm gonna do, I felt pretty good with chapter five and it took me about five hours to write. So I have a whole week this week. I'm just gonna knock out like four more chapters. So you write chapters one through four and then you're done. So what I do, I kind of give all of that background information because I like to actually, if someone likes a more tactile project management process, I would recommend, I should have drawn something up on the whiteboard behind me, but I didn't, I wasn't no, I that's about that, but <laughs> <laughs> you, so um, you can have uh, like a column that says like backlog. And then next to that, you have one that says in progress or it could say like to do in progress. And then you have completed. Right. So just a three column, you know, little flow chart there. And then you can take post-it notes or if you want to get real fancy, like Velcro magnet kind of whatever, whatever works for you, whatever you have at your house, post-it notes are great. Yeah. Um, and you, and you can literally write down what, what you want to accomplish um, in any given a piece of time. And and this is where I this is where I do my three and four month planning that I was referencing back then. So mm -hmm. I would write, I would write, um, I would write out a post-it note for all of the broad tasks that I want to complete in a three or four month period. And I would try to the best of my ability to decide how much time each of those would take me to complete. Right. And then, you know, every time I sit down to work, I take, you know, I'll, I'll take three post-it notes and I'll put them into the like in progress column. And so what I just like write chapter, write an outline, write chapter one. Once I know how long chapter one takes me to write, you know, write additional chapters in bulk. Those would be like, those would be a great first two weeks for a book, maybe mm -hmm. depending on how much time you have. And then once you've completed that, you move those cards over to the, uh, completed column and that is so that is so mentally satisfying that you get to celebrate those little wins along the way by moving those cards into the completed uh, so category so then you're not waiting for the completion of your first draft you can celebrate like hey I freaking wrote like 1 20th of my book today like go me <laughs> <laughs> <Woo -hoo! So. laughs> and it's like you have you have to find those little wins and Yes. And I'm, I'm kind of a math person too. So I like to, I like to measure how much time it takes me to write a chapter and then say, okay, that chapter took me, you know, five hours to write. Now I'm going to try to do another one in four. <laughs> and it's like a little game you play with yourself. <laughs> yeah. That competitiveness. <laughs> yes. Yes. So again, and this isn't, I wouldn't recommend that for every single person, but it's definitely something it's it's a starting point and if it works for you awesome if it doesn't you can also iteratively tweak your process too oh, yeah. so that it better fits you so you can you don't have to break it up exactly the way that i broke it up you could 
literally have one card be write the first draft. If you're a super fast writer and you have, you know, eight to five every day to write, just knock that first draft out in two weeks, like go for it. But that was not, that was not my schedule at the time. No, <laughs> I had to break it up even further. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, breaking, breaking the work up into digestible chunks and digestible is different for each person. Breaking the work up into digestible chunks, writing it down, and then allowing yourself to work through those, those chunks in a, um, in kind of a controlled manner. That's, that's what I would recommend. And that is, that is in effect, a very, very high level version of agile project management. Okay. And in, and in doing so, you're also reducing that fear of unknown, because now you have that expectation of, oh, this is what I got to do. This is the plan. So having that set in motion is going to be very beneficial to those that need that structure. Um, and someone who that structure is intimidating, they can adjust it and make it more free flowing or freeing or whatever that they need. It's completely adjustable to the, the individual. So that's cool. I, yeah, I like how you explained all of that. Cause <laughs> you really portrayed that, that ability to make it yours. And that is so important because when we try to copy or emulate what somebody else does, it doesn't necessarily resonate with us. And, and what does that do? It chokes us up like uh, I'm doing this wrong when really you can't do it wrong. As long as you're doing something, you're really not doing it wrong. <laughs> right. It's only wrong if it's not working for you. If, if I had set the expectation with myself that I was going to have my first draft completed in two weeks back in 2015 when I started this. I, I would have failed miserably and I probably would have really beat myself up over that. But I knew that just was not going to happen when I was working full time. And I also go to bed at like nine o'clock. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and you got kids and you got a puppy and <laughs> yes, life. I'm sure you got friends that are saying, Hey, let's go do X, Y, Z. You're not, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. And you can't cut yourself off from the world either. Cause if you're not living, what are you going to write about? <laughs> Exactly, because what we write is in in some shape or form is us. It's it's our experiences. It's the things we've overheard. It's the it's life. It's just life. However, it comes to you, whether it comes to you on a silver platter or somebody, you know, does that sideways skid right up beside you and says, hey, here you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to allow life to happen too. And I think that's a really important part of agile. Um, waterfall would be like, you're missing deadlines. Like, you know, you're <laughs> you're not completing this on time. You're missing deadlines. You didn't you didn't fill this change request to, you know, tell me that you were going to take three weeks longer to do your developmental edits. Agile is just like, just tell me what you're up to <laughs> and I will. I will be there for you. <laughs> but see, you know, when, when I hear people, and I'm I'm so grateful you you brought up the the waterfall way, and then the other one because of the fact that what you hear as far as product management is that waterfall plan everything out and. This is your time frame for this and your time frame for that and your time frame for this other thing. And by golly, by gee, you better have it done by by this or. And of course, that or it's a threat, you know, oh, I'm going to get punished. I'm going to I'm in trouble. Well, what happens to half the people out there? They they look at it as is like, all right, let's go competition. Let's get it on. The other people are like. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be in trouble. <laughs> so. Right. There's that, there's that John Lennon quote, like life is what happens while you're making other plans. And somewhere I heard, I don't remember. I wish I could give them credit. I heard someone say, I, it was just like a friend that I met at a conference, but they said, agile is what happens while you're making waterfall plans. <laughs> so there's a joke, there's a joke in kind of the project management community. And I know there's going to be like waterfall people. If they were listening to this, they'd be like, Oh, how dare she? But, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very polarized. It's very polarized. Really? But, um, 
yeah, agile basically happens on all waterfall projects. It's just a lot harder when it happens on a waterfall project because there there's a lot more structure and kind of pomp and circumstance around it. And agile just says, we know this is going to happen. We're going to have to deal with change. We're going to have to make adjustments and we're just going to make it easier for those adjustments to happen. And I and I think if you if you think about that while you're writing a book, it allows you to do the things during that creative process that actually I think make your book better, whether it's, you know, a process, whether the process is better, whether you go out and and have some lived experience that influences your approach to some concept or element of the book. Brody Monster, actually, I started writing it before. I started writing it. There's about a, I think there's a, I think I calculated a six month overlap. I started writing the book before the book concludes, if that makes sense. So I actually lived part of the book after I started writing the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, in many memoirs, that's what happens um, is we think we know how it's going to end, but when you get writing it, it's like, oh, oh, wait, this this rolls right into this. And it fits, you know, it's like that missing key that really helps to embellish and, and to broaden the story and, and tie everything together. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, yeah, you were living it while you were writing it. Yeah. <laughs> In, yeah, the agile version of uh, setting up the project management really does give you that flexibility. So, I, I, yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I'm really grateful because I have a friend who is a project manager. And now it's like next time we talk, I'm going to I'm going to ask her. So are you a waterfall or <laughs> agile? Because I had no idea that there was, you know, this, this, you know, uh, controversy or, you know, polarization <laughs> between the two. It's like, because I, I've known her for so long and I guess I never asked her. It's like, now I'm really curious, which are you? <laughs> yes. And you will be judging her based on her answer, right? <laughs> I've known her too long. I've, I've, uh, I've known her for way too long that I think I already know my answer, but it'll be interesting to know if I'm right. <laughs> I may even have to send her a text message. Are you a waterfall or agile? And she's probably going to go question mark. <laughs> yes. Who have you been talking to? <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> It probably won't be the first time she's heard the question, so. <laughs> well, probably not. Probably. Well, if it sounds like it's a very, I don't want to say tight knit community, but it is a click. It's, it's like a very much a niche uh, environment. And, and, and again, not that any one way is right or wrong, but you all have your different rhythms and, and what works for you and so forth. And, and I find this fascinating because I am someone who is, I'm anal in the regard that everything's got to be categorized. Everything's got to be chronological. Every, everything's got to be sorted and, and put into their, their cubby holes, I guess you could say. And so in many ways, I, this just fits into what I already naturally do. Um, I'm not necessarily good at planning things out because, you know, I, 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 I raised the two boys. I had the dogs. I had, you know, this and that and the full-time job. And, and I had life interruptions. And so the more I tried to plan things out, the more life came in and said, yeah, no. You're going to do this now. <laughs> right, right. And that's that's the norm. That is probably the, the rule versus the exception. Yes. So I really love that we're talking about this because I guess I, I hadn't put into consideration that, wow, that is really how I function is, is that project management 
line of categorizing and, and setting things into motion. So now it'll be really interesting because I am at a point, uh, I have one book that I've been working on and it, it's taken years to, to, I've been like adding bits and pieces. And of course, nothing congeals because it's different voices. It's different. I've changed a lot since I started writing the book. And of course, my wisdom has grown from that as well through life experiences. And so now I'm sitting at looking at this book, and I'm like going, Oh, my God, I wrote that. And then parts of me are like, damn, that's brilliant. <laughs> and so now I'm going to literally, I'm going to sit down with this book, and I'm going to go, okay, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, what do I want here? What do I want there? What is the time frame for this? Oh, I'm thinking that agile. I'm definitely not doing the waterfall because <laughs> I, I would set myself up for failure with the waterfall. <laughs> but the agile, I, I really, I mean, I use the sauna for for my virtual assistant uh, projects because I'm able to task everything out. And I, yeah, I think I'm going to be like tapping into that application. And <laughs> well, and that brings up that brings up a great point. And I wanted to share this too, because because you just mentioned Asana, and and that's a very well known project management tool. If anyone, if any of the listeners out there are looking for a tool to get started, and they don't want to do kind of the whiteboard post it note approach. Um, I, I don't know, I, I'm not super familiar with Asana, but they might, I don't know if they have an agile board, but Trello um, is a free software tool out there that's part of the Atlassian project management suite. They right. have a they have a board that you can set up that's configurable. Um, yeah, Asana. and they're part of the like Jira community. There's a bunch of tools under under that. So you can really blow that out if you get, you know, really into project management, but Trello is great. There's um, there's also a product called Workfront that's probably a little bit more um, geared toward enterprise. But if there's someone out there from the publishing industry and you want to throw all your author authors onto Workfront, um, definitely a great consideration for that. Um, and then you can you can get really really fancy with all kinds of stuff up, above and beyond that. But oh, yeah. you know, it just it just depends on on what you're looking for. Trello is a great a great testing ground though, because it is free and it's open source and it's, it's really fantastic for kind of dipping your toe in the water without any financial commitment. Yeah. Asana has the same, they have the free, uh, free version. Of course they have the paid version and they do have the boards and you can set up the columns. You can set up your notifications just like Trello. Um, mm -hmm. Both are great. Uh, I've used both um, for whatever reason. I, I just, Oh, because one of my clients uh, used uh, Asana. So it was just easy for us to communicate. Yeah through that and that's how that how I ended up with that so um one thing that I did want to bring up was the fact that you narrate nonfiction and fiction books <laughs> and so this this opens up a whole new a whole new realm for me because I, this voice I seriously doubt I'm going to be narrating my own book because, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no. It's one thing that I put myself out there on podcast. <laughs> I, yeah, um, it's another to sit and read a book. I'm. It's not something I'm sure I really want to do. But what should we as authors consider when it comes time to producing an audit? in audio book, if I can say the word properly. So uh, I think the very first thing to consider um, is, is whether you are, why you want an audio book. Is, is this something that your audience is really uh, looking for? Or is it something that you want to do so you can learn the, the process? Um, because as far as I can tell, and just from looking into it, audiobooks are probably the least lucrative format of book that really? you can create because they're very expensive to produce. 
Oh, and, yeah. and, and, and a lot, a lot of avid readers still prefer a physical, a physical book. I mean, we hear that all the time from the book industry, right? Yeah, I have, I have more physical books <laughs> than I, I yes. have anything else. So I pers I'm an anomaly reader because I primarily read by listening to audiobooks. Um, I like nap, I call it nap reading. So like when my kids are uh, napping, I will read and like fold laundry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I knew, I knew that my target audience for Brody Monster was likely going to be my kind of peers, um, most likely people that I knew uh, to start out with. I mean, I knew that my friends were going to be buying this book first and foremost before anyone else. And I wanted them to have a format that they could listen to. But if, if that does not apply to you, um, if your book is more in the is is truly in the nonfiction, more reference realm or something like that, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend going full bore toward an audiobook right away. But if you decide that an audiobook is uh, worth your time, um, then you then you also have to think about: Do I want to narrate the audiobook? Um, do I? do I have the time to do that? Is that something, I, that's actually something I was going to say early on is with anything in the book production process, not just audiobook, you have to decide whether it's something you want to do or whether you want to hire it out. So that's something you should consider, you should be considering all along the way. Um, but in particular with audiobooks, you have to decide, do I want to narrate this audiobook? Do you, I mean, I have a vocal music background. So, um, I have learned little tips and tricks along the way to help with voice fatigue. And I switch, I switch registers of my voice and I can do it. I mean, I just switched to head voice and I don't know if you could even tell that I switched to head voice, but I just kind of relaxed my vocal cords and moved it up into my head just to give them a break. So um, I felt <laughs> there's all kinds of fun musical facts that apply to audiobook recording, but um that that is that is something to think about um now if someone came to me and they said my target audience is young moms i you know i'm a singer um i don't i don't want to spend five thousand dollars to pay someone to narrate my book but i have to have an audiobook version i would say yeah you should record your own audiobook and mm -hmm. there there are tons of ways to approach that too so um I decided ultimately that I wanted to narrate this book because it is a memoir and it is written in first person. So it's my voice. And I just felt like that would feel really strange to hear, you know, Jennifer Garner telling my story. <laughs> cool. Although I would love it if she wanted to tell my story. That would be amazing. Well, she um, just play in the movies, you know. Yeah, the movie. You know, <laughs> yeah. I can only I can only hope, but <laughs> um so so when if you do decide um to hire someone, you can you can start that whole process through uh ACX on Amazon and I they they will allow you to open up your profile as an author seeking a narrator and they'll connect you to talent. But then you have to, there's all kinds of legal considerations. So you have to think about, um, you know, are they SAG, you know, are they part of the the SAG union? Are, you know, what, what does that all entail? So because of the legal ramifications of all of this stuff, a lot of the times, because this was my first book and I wasn't working through a traditional publisher, um, I just came to the conclusion with a lot of this that I was just going to do it myself as a learning experience and just know that the the return on investment was probably not going to be ideal. But I was like, I want to learn. I want to learn this. I want to learn how to do this. And it was worth the the education that I got um, for two for two of the books that I've narrated. Um, those are those were actually narrated in a in a like uh DIY studio that I built in my basement. Oh, um, yeah, and I wouldn't recommend that <laughs> <laughs> um, because I ended. I did end up. So I recorded them in a homemade audio studio in my basement, but then I I actually ended up sending them to a studio to be professionally produced and edited. So that that process, that editing process, 
I might have saved a few hours by recording it myself in my basement, but it wasn't substantial. Um, and this for Brody Monster, I went into a studio, local studio. It's called Shock City Studios. We have here in St. Louis. Okay. Um, there are studios like that, and you know, if you're if you're in a, a small to mid-size, you know, to large size city in the U.S., I'm guarantee there's a a good studio studio somewhere in town that you can yes. that you can reach out to. And what we did is we did a combined um, edit record, which is very exhausting, but also super efficient. So I recorded um, the audiobook and we edited it all at the same time. So on the last day that I was in the studio wow. and I finished, yeah, and I finished the last chapter, there were maybe a few hours left of um, mastering um, and equalizing left to do on the audio files. But essentially it was done the second that I walked out of the studio. So that was a positive experience, but it was tiring and I would spend four or five hours in the studio at a time. And a lot of that time I would spend kind of sitting there waiting for the sound engineer to, to edit. The advantage of doing that is that if you go into a sound, uh, if you, if you go into a recording situation and you, you know, you always mess up at some point, I, I could usually get through a couple pages before I'd stumble over my words. And that was like on a good day. So when I'd stumble over my words, he'd stop and he'd go back and he'd edit whatever I had read between my last mistake and my next mistake. And that allows you to completely re-record any sections if there are any issues. So if there's like, sometimes my, like the nozzle on my water bottle would squeak or something. Oh, <laughs> um, the noise. Things like that. Yeah. yeah. People don't, <laughs> so, and people who don't record things, don't realize I mean obviously you can see I'm in a camper and <laughs> that's why I call it my virtual studio because quite literally my virtual studio travels wherever I'm at and it's 80 plus degrees outside I've got the windows open you hear the birds um I used to do a podcast oh years and years and years ago and I had a clock and I didn't hear it when I was recording because I'm focused on reading my script, blah, blah, blah. And then I go to listen to the recording. And it's like, what is that noise? Oh, my God, that's a refrigerator running. Oh, wait, that's that clock. And so that is something truly that a, a lot of people don't realize and just like before we started recording the this podcast when I mentioned that you know you're in a conference room and it's it's got good acoustics because you don't sound like you're in a tin can where in many <laughs> in many conference rooms you sound like you're in a tin can mm -hmm. you know I had one gal who it the the vibration back was horrible and and so she went out in her car and it was like yay I can hear you and it, it, surprisingly enough our vehicles are great acoustically because they're padded they <laughs> so, are yes you know that's <laughs> another thing to consider is, is what is your background and by doing it in your basement I'm surprised you know if somebody flushed the toilet you know you got the plumbing overhead <laughs> oh that's a good point we actually had to turn off our we had to turn off our entire um like HVAC system so I would turn off our HVAC system when I would do that. And I also invested in um, a little uh, thing called an ISOVOX, which yeah. it's I-S-O-V-O-X. If anyone's listening, please Google this. It's like this space age contraption. It's hilarious. You just have to see a picture of it. <laughs> okay. Um, it goes on a speaker. It goes on a speaker tripod and it basically deadens all the sound around your head and you just kind of pop your head up into it and it's got a light on the inside. <laughs> And you put your iPad in there. It's it's hilarious. So wow, yeah, just they're expensive, um, but it's it's kind of nice to have when I do like vocal music recordings in my basement. But Isovox is what I used because you do and like you could hear things as as light as my dog's nails clicking oh, on the floor as he yeah. walked above me, and so that's why I knew I needed the Isovox, but. 
turning off the HVAC, the HVAC ran under, like you could still hear the noise coming under the, the ISO box. So we, there were just some things we had to turn off. I had to like close and lock our basement door. <laughs> <laughs> We also learned how very ineffective our, we have sound batting between our first floor um, and our basement. So we even have a little bit heavier duty insulation. Yeah, it was, <laughs> we could still hear stuff. <laughs> That's funny. And if there's a couple of podcasts where one in particular, oh, I was interviewing uh, Crystal Cockerham. And and it was so funny because we're 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 talking along and all of a sudden the owner of the campground that I was staying at goes past with the lawnmower. So I'd be like, hang on a second, he's coming back. So we would just sit and wait, you know, I'd pause the recording and then we get back and you could hear him it was, it was like you got the if you if somebody was with headsets and was paying attention you would hear the lawnmower coming a little bit and then going away yes. <laughs> like it never arrived <laughs> yeah and you don't you don't even realize it but that is so distracting when you produce a book like you're talking about the podcast, but if you have those kinds of things in your book, that's so distracting and, and you really pull your readers away from the, the point of the narrative. So it's really, really important to, to have a good quality um, audiobook recording. But at the same time, um, you know, do what you need to do. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And in this case, imperfection is perfect. And that yes. is one of the hardest lessons that over the years I've had to learn and you can't control everything. And I, I've learned that why, why am I trying to control that? I, I guess maybe having teenage boys or well, preteen boys kind of broke me of that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, it is, uh, we've been talking for almost an hour. So, um, is there anything that I missed that you would like to share? Is there uh, something that you really wanted to hit on before I wrap up the podcast? No, I think I would just say, you know, just to kind of follow up on, on what you were just touching on. Everything in life is a project. This can apply to your these these kind of tools and techniques can apply to book production, but also any other project that you're working on. And um, I think a lot of people think of project managers as very type A uh, kind of uh, rigid people. But if you are, you know, becoming a project manager for the sake of the projects in your life, whether it's a, a book writing and production project or anything else, just realize that the very, very best project managers are those people who appreciate structure and form, but can stray from it when they have to. And I, and I think that will be a huge differentiating factor in the completion rate of your, your books and your work. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed wholeheartedly. So Liz, where can people find you on the internet and find your book? Um, well, so the best place to find anything is at lizmerits.com, L-I-Z-M-A-R-I-T-Z.com. Um, that is that is where I post everything. I am somewhat active, but not super active on social media. Um, I like to kind of be IRL, like to be present in life, and I'm not always posting on social media that often. Well, Liz, I do want to thank you so, so very much for joining me here. Obviously, you and I could talk. I mean, I didn't even hit, um, you know, I didn't even bring up about finding a good editor or, you know, navigating what it was like for you to do the self-publishing. So it's obvious you and I could spend a lot of time talking. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to say that for next time <laughs> i am great well thank you thank you for having me cindy i really appreciate it you are welcome before we end our time together i'd like to say thank you for joining us you can learn more about liz access her website and the book she has written 
by visiting the show notes for this episode at pen to paperpress.com backslash podcast. To receive future episodes in your inbox, subscribe to the Pen to Paper Press newsletter and subscribe to your favorite podcast app. Take care and until next time, keep your pen to paper and write. And know that your words, they have power and your story matters. Bye for now.